We are so glad that you have joined us for worship this morning. My name is Megan Otto and I am the campus minister here at University United Methodist Church. Today, Pastor John continues our series, Scripture with a Twist, and we will be talking about the theme of Jesus and guns. We will also be celebrating communion today, and we encourage you to have juice and bread or wine with you during the service so that you can participate with us. We hope the words and music of the service speak to your heart today as we gather together. Welcome friends, we're glad you're here.
friends, it is time in the service to pass the peace. I encourage you to show signs of peace to those in the chat box and those in your home. The peace of Christ be with you. The birth of a child is an event so wonderful, so humbling, and yet so awe-inspiring that all faith traditions of the world have a ritual of welcome and blessing. We join our hearts and voices with faith communities of every kind and in every age, and we offer thanks and seek blessings today. Baptism is a sacrament of the church. It is a sign of God's love acting in our lives. Through baptism, we are received into the church, the body of Christ, the family of God. For us, the water is symbolic of life itself, and the, the waters of a mother's womb, as well as the water out of which all life is created and sustained. The water is also a symbol of the life-giving power of God's love working in the world. As we pour this water, may it be a reminder that God's love is poured out on all creation and that love overflows in us and love for our neighbors. Friends, we are happy to be celebrating the baptism of Callie Morgan. She's a happy girl. We had the privilege of baptizing her big sister, Adley, a couple of years ago, and their parents are Elizabeth and Ellis Morgan. Elizabeth and Ellis, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you these questions. Do you accept God's call to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you accept Jesus as the sign of God's unconditional grace and as the source of your freedom to act boldly in this world? Do you promise to love, support, and care for Callie as she grows in Christ? We do. And by the grace of God, do you promise to follow Christ and to grow with her in Christian faith? Will you help her to be a faithful member of this community and celebrate the presence of God's Spirit in all of life? You will say, by God's grace, we will. By God's grace, we will. University United Methodist Church, each of us has an important role to fulfill. These people will need a community of love and forgiveness as they grow in their faith and service to God. Will all of you help provide this community and teach these people to be faithful witnesses to God's love and justice. If so, say, with God's help, we will. With, with God's, God's help, help, we will. will. Let us profess our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is created, who has come with Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make him who works in us and others by the Spirit. We, we trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to, to live with respect in creation, to, to love and serve our brothers, to, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in, in life, life in death, in life beyond the grave. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O Holy One, Mother and Father of all the faithful, for this child and for your grace present here today. Pour out your spirit to bless this gift of water and the one who receives it, to liberate and guide her throughout her life into the joy of faith, the freedom of love, and the hope of new life through Jesus Christ, who makes us one. What name is given this child? Callie Barron. Callie, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. 
May God work within you, that being born of water and spirit, you may ever be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as your new church family, baby girl, we welcome you in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated into Christ's new creation by the power of God's Spirit. With joy and thanks, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. And as in baptism, we put on Christ. So in Christ, may you be clothed in glory. Amen. Please welcome Kelly by clapping and by commenting in the chat box. I invite you to join with me in our prayer for illumination. Startle us, O oh God, with truth so big, so glorious, words will never contain it. Startle us with love that overcomes all, even death. In this Easter season, open our eyes to see your loving, reconciling work in our world. Open our ears so we may hear your voice in the voices of others. And open our hearts to love that assures us there is nothing to fear ever, for Jesus is not dead, but risen. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 35. To 38. Jesus is talking to the disciples, getting ready to send them out, and he says to them, When I sent you out before without a purse or sandals or a bag, did you lack anything? And the disciples said, No, not a thing. Then Jesus said to them, But now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag. And the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this is the scripture that must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless. And indeed, what was written about me is being fulfilled. The disciples said, look, here are two swords. And Jesus said to them, it is enough. The word of life. Thanks be to God. Okay, yes, we are doing the twist this month. I have all these wires and lights. What in the world am I doing the twist in this space? Hey, if I can do the twist, you can do the twist. So we're twisting this month, recognizing that our scriptures are so often misread. They're misquoted, they are misinterpreted. And so with a healthy and righteous Jesus twist, scripture comes alive. And it challenges us to live lives worthy of the coming kingdom. The grace, mercy, and peace of the triune God be with you all. Amen. Okay, it was the 2017 legislative session. It was late afternoon, almost five. And I was making a final run through emails and one caught my eye. It was about Donna Howard's bill that would repeal campus carry. Do you remember that one? College students had rallies with sex toys and said, I can't take this on campus, but I can take my gun in my purse. Oh, it was memorable. Well, the center was asking folks to call Representative Stickland's office, Representative Jonathan Stickland, who wanted constitutional carry more than anything else in the whole wide world. We were asked to call and ask Stickland to stop harassing Howard supporters. Since I would take a bullet for Donna Howard, I called his office. I barely launched into my spiel about my opposition to campus carry when the person on the other end interrupted and said, 
So, you think it's okay for a state university to take federal funds and not follow the Second Amendment? Hmm, I thought this was a bit unusual for a staff member to be so argumentative and aggressive, but I carried on back and forth for several minutes and finally I stopped and, and, and I asked, I, I said, I'm sorry, we've been talking for a while and I didn't catch your name. This is Representative Stickland. Game on! The conversation moved to a, a whole new level. I was finally able to get the Honorable Representative to stop interrupting long enough to present a scenario. What might happen if someone came into a lecture hall at UT? You've been through UT campus. You know how big those lecture halls are. And they open fire, heaven forbid, open fire. And several others in the hall who were carrying took out their guns. And then the police arrived. What then? Pastor Elford, he said, if I were in that classroom, I would want to have the biggest, baddest gun I could carry. Well... This is one way, I suppose, to keep the peace, one that we're all too familiar with in Texas. Sadly and bafflingly, it's a way that some would claim support for in the Bible, in the words of Jesus. So when Christian folks want to argue for more and more guns in public spaces, they turn to Jesus, to the short story that we read this morning. Representative Stickland brought it up in our conversation. I told him that I had written an explanation of that verse about Jesus and the two swords for Senator Kirk Watson. Could I send it along to him? Silence. (laughs) I, I sent it anyway. It went like this. This text in Luke 22 is confusing. Because Jesus seems not only to be urging that the disciples go out and buy swords, but also that he's totally okay with them carrying swords. Jesus was for open sword carry. The Bible said it, I believe it, and so on. Only one little speed bump here. This is the only place in the Gospels where Jesus appears to advocate carrying a weapon. Not only that, The verses run counter to the entire New Testament and everything that we know from early church history about its commitment to nonviolence. Was Jesus under so much pressure that he simply lost it? Thought it was time to come out swinging? As Catholic scholar John Deere put it, this is a naive reading. A careful reading observes that in every other text having anything to do with violence, Jesus is clearly on the side of nonviolence. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Those who take the sword will die by the sword. Even though it appears that Jesus told the disciples to buy a sword, just a few verses later, he makes it abundantly clear that he didn't intend them to use it. Because here, Jesus not only heals the ear of the soldier, Uh, the ear that was cut off by one of his followers, he says, enough of this, making it public that he had no plans for armed resistance. So, why in the world would Jesus tell the disciples to get swords in Luke 22? The only reading that makes sense of the passage in the context of Jesus' life is that he's talking like a rabbi. He's using hyperbole, as he often did in his ministry. He's talking about the difficulties that they're going to face out there, and not literally about going out and arming themselves. He's saying the disciples are going to have to fall back on their own resources, and there's not going to be a welcome wagon greeting them as they arrive in villages preaching the gospel. Well, the disciples take him literally, as they often do, and they produce two swords. Jesus' reply, it is enough, is usually taken to mean that two swords are enough. Like two swords would be enough for them to take on a Roman cohort. Right. But there's another perfectly valid translation, which is enough of this talk. 
Drop it. You miss the point. Twist. I'm sure the reason Representative Stickland is no longer in the legislature is that he read my interpretation, he saw the light, and he repented of his ways. Thanks be to God. This is a problem, though, that so much of the debate about guns is not reasonable and rational, but it's, but it's emotional. And it's one of the reasons that up until today, I've never preached on guns. Never. I mean, it just seemed like a, like a waste of time. Thomas Paine once said, to argue with a person who has renounced the use of reason is like administering medicine to the dead. Nevertheless, here we are in a country with which averages 40,000 or, or more gun deaths a year and a much higher rate of gun deaths than, than other wealthy Western nations. And so I'm wondering now, if I should have preached about guns earlier and, and more often. I mean, most of these deaths are not mass shootings. They're homicides, they're suicides, they're accidental shootings. Now, the good news in all of this, if you can even call it that, is that the facts really are on the side of more sensible gun reforms. Just take one example. Whenever there is a mass shooting, we go through this predictable routine as a country. If anyone even mentions the idea of gun control, someone from the other side will say, well, what we really need is more funding for mental health. Okay, that's true. We do need more funding for mental health. But look at the facts. Many, many countries with the same rate of mental illness as the United States have substantially lower rates of gun deaths. Substantially. Also, in a recent study done by our flagship university next door on gun violence and mental illness, guess what they found to be the best predictor of someone using a gun? Not mental illness, but access to guns. We know this stuff. We know it. I mean, according to a, a recent Harvard study, whether someone lives or dies in a suicide attempt is directly related to the availability of guns. Okay, I don't want to go through all the studies. It's, it's dark and, and, and it's depressing, and I, I apologize even for bringing it up, but, but we know that in our country, we, we simply have far too easy access to guns, and, and we don't seem to have the political will to do anything about it. The other piece of good news is that the majority of Americans want sensible gun reforms. In a 2019 survey, 89% want expanded background checks. 76% support red flag laws to identify dangerous persons and deny them guns. 62% of Americans favor a ban on the sale of semi-automatic weapons. Okay, I know, I am really preaching to the choir this morning. Many of you are, are sitting at home and you're shouting, Amen, go get them, Pastor John, in a nonviolent way. And maybe you're scribbling down a, a quote to put on Facebook or send to a friend. But, but I'm pretty sure that probably no one will be swayed to join our side, the side of sensible gun reforms by, by stuff that I've said this morning. And substantive change on gun laws in Texas and on our nation is sadly something our children and our grandchildren are going to have to wrestle with. But that's not where I want to wind up this morning as, as a church that aspires to be a prophetic community. Just throwing my hands in the air and saying, well, there's nothing we can do. Speaking out may not bring change right now. But speaking out may be the only Christian action I can take in the context that we are in right now. And sadly, there are a myriad of opportunities to speak out against senseless gun laws. 
I am moved and encouraged by folks who speak out against the odds, like Pastor Rob Schenk, who is featured in the documentary, The Armor of Light. Schenk is an evangelical Christian minister who regularly engages with other evangelicals in conversations about gun sense. In the movie, it kind of looks like the proverbial banging your head against a brick wall, but he speaks anyway. I love this quote. He says, in respecting the second amendment, we must be careful we don't violate the second commandment, which prohibits the worship of idols made by human hands. Mm. I am moved by friends who speak out against the odds, like Nicole Hollis Golden, former head of Moms Demand Action here in Texas, and Andrea Brower, former head of Texas Gun Sense, who continue to lobby in support of better regulations. Yesterday, Nicole put up a picture on Facebook of her tired self wrapped in a blanket in one of the hearing rooms at the legislature. If you've ever been there to give testimony, they make you wait six hours and it's about 50 degrees in, in the rooms. I emailed Andrea yesterday to, say, to see if she could come speak to us about gun regulation. And she said she'd have to get back to me. She was in line to speak at a hearing on SB 1927. That's the bill that would allow permitless carry. Oh my goodness, my friends, this is the perseverance of the saints. So let's speak out, my friends. Let's make our voices heard in the name of the one who came to bring life, not death. And let's not be deterred by the opposition. Let us say by all the means we can, in all the ways we can, in all the places we can, at all the times we can, to all the people we can, as long as we possibly can, this deranged reality must change. The idolization of guns must end. Laws of common sense must be passed. May it be so. And may God give us the moral courage to speak and to act. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we pray that all people will realize the profound impact gun violence has on so many of us. Guide us toward peace and, and away from violence. Let us pray for the, the countless victims of gun violence. Help them to, to feel comforted in a world that seems like it is full of violence and evil. Holy God, teach us to value all life. May we abandon our violent ways, all of us, all of them, and may we become advocates for peace. Amen.
invite you to join with me in our prayer of confession. God of justice, when we fail to advocate for gun law reform, for sensible restrictions on purchases, for limiting the power of those who benefit from the gun industry, God have mercy. When we project blame for gun violence on those with mental illness, those who are strangers, and those who are immigrants, Christ have mercy. When we fail to work for a disarmed society, to advocate for justice, health care, and education for all, to learn to talk through our fears and communicate across boundaries, to work to establish a just world for all. God have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sin, and lead us to life of peace and abundance. Amen. Gracious one, even as our hearts break, they do so in the care of your embrace. Since the beginning, you have been with us. Out of love, you created us. Out of love, you became like us. Out of love, you sustain us still. In the face of violence, oppression, tyranny, and injustice, you choose to take on flesh. Not only to experience it all with us, but to liberate us into new ways of living and loving. In the person of Jesus Christ, we witnessed love and fleshed, vulnerable, present, courageous, unwilling to resign to believing things have to be this way. Jesus, deeply tender toward those whose lives cried out for compassion and fiercely provoking those for whom salvation could only look like repentance, Jesus showed us how to live in a world where power is imbalanced and violence is common. On the night of his betrayal, Christ gathered among friends at table. Sharing in presence and meal, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and shared it with his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the meal was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and told his disciples, Take this and share it among yourselves. This is the cup of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have shown us that violence and death never have the last word. Life persists. Hope persists. Love persists. Pour out your spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and cup. Through them, make us Christ's body alive in the world, beckoning forth your kingdom through compassion and tenderness, lament and righteous anger. By your spirit, make us one in the work for liberation, one in mutual interdependence and one in commitment to love until every tear is wiped away and all can feast at your table. Amen. In collective longing for a taste of your kingdom on earth, we join together in echoing the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the bread of heaven. Please break the bread in your homes. 
The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the cup of salvation. Please raise your cup and give thanks to God for all God's gifts, especially the gift of grace. And now take a piece of bread, dip it into the cup, and eat. If you are with family, you may serve one another. Let us pray. God, it is from you that we learn to hunger for justice. Make this taste of your kingdom linger in our memory each time we lose sight of hope. Through your table and in communion with one another and all the saints, you nourish us. We give you thanks for the ways that you sustain us in the work of creating a world free from violence, free from the fear of entering a church or a school or a mosque or a music festival or wherever we turn for refuge. May it be so. Amen. Poor man, Lazarus, sick and disabled, did you think it in the water coming? Poor my tongue cries, I'm tormented in the pain. He had a fish crumbs from the fish man's table. Dip your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. I'm tormented in the flame. I'm tormented in the flame. Dip your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. Fish man died, he sing it so well. Dip your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. And when he died, he went straight to hell. Dip your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. I'm tormented in the flame. I'm tormented in the flame. Dip your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. I love to shout, I love I love to praise my heavenly King. Dip your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. I'm tormented in the flame. I'm tormented in the flame. Hi, my name is Heather Green and I am the Associate Pastor for Children and Families here at University Methodist in Austin, Texas. Today, I want to thank you again for your generous support and contributions to our church. Because of you, we are able to continue to be the church to our community and seek justice everywhere. If you're interested in giving today, I encourage you to visit our website, www.uumc.org and find the donate button. And again, thank you. If you would like to know more about University Methodist in Austin, Texas, we would love to hear from you and we can add you to our electronic newsletter Simply email office at uumc.org and we will be in touch. In just a few moments, we will join our voices in our closing hymn. And today we will be singing a song written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillett, who wrote these words after the shooting at Sutherland Springs in Texas. It is called, If We Just Talk of Thoughts and Prayers. Hear her words about this hymn. We are called to pay attention to what is going on in the world around us and to lift up concerns and tragedies in our prayers to God. God does want us to pray and to show concern for victims and their families. Yet we can never let the words, they are in our thoughts and prayers, 
be a substitute for seeking laws and policies that bring us a more just and peaceable world. As Christians, we are called to follow the way of Jesus and to work for peace, justice, nonviolence, better mental health care, and sensible gun laws, such as the ones that restrict the availability of military weapons to civilians. I invite you now to join me in singing. receive these words of benediction and blessing. Go in peace, my friends. Serve God with joy. Give thanks, even though you have considered all the facts. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to speak out about the things that you care deeply about. For God is with you. And God will bless you and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.